or discharged from the hospital. Discharged. Is there a reason you didn't stay with Dr. Stout or not? Because of my insurance, I insurance. think. Okay. And um, he had a lot of patients, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, they recommended Dr. Bristol. What, what's your current insurance? Who's your current? Georgia Medicaid. Georgia Medicaid. Mm -hmm. okay. And I know we talked earlier um, about funeral arrangements, and you said there, there would be no funeral? I can't see him in a box. Okay. I just can't do it. Okay. I can't do that. Do you I have any insurance on him to have yes. the crematory done? Yes, I do, but I don't know how long it's going to take to go through. I have to call the insurance company. Okay. Who do you have your insurance through? For through the hospital, Gerber Life. Okay, through Gerber. Okay. Um, tomorrow, when they bring him back from the autopsy, um, I know it's probably a hard decision for you, but we have to have a funeral home to at least send him to for the cremation to take place. I haven't even thought of one, but okay. I guess there's Gold Niles Crematory. I, I, I guess I can call there. I haven't been home, so I haven't been able to call anybody. Okay. Well, as long as your phone has minutes on it, we can call and we can coordinate that for you, or at least talk to you and figure out what, what you have decided in case you change your mind. You, you can always do that. You can change your mind and decide to have a service if you wish. But we just want to make sure we send them to the right funeral home. Okay. Well, I'll think about it tonight. Okay. Also, we were supposed to meet those officers over at your apartment. That's um, fine. To look around. They're not going to throw all my furniture around. We're on not going to. We're not going to destroy your. Oh, your thank home. God, because I can't fall moving that stuff again. Okay. But we are going to search it and and. Check for things, clear it, make sure it's clear of anybody that may be inside and everything, make Thank sure it's safe, but we are going to search it, okay? Sure. For firearms and things like that. That's fine. Okay. And Louise, I think Officer Gary has already taken him home, so I'll be the one to drive you home. Fine. Okay. Do you have any questions for me, Ms. West? No, I just hope that when you find them, you let me know. Okay. You call me and leave a message if I don't pick up my phone. Okay. Is there anywhere that you need to go before you go home? By the drugstore or anything like that? Get a prescription I guess I'll bill? have to wait till tomorrow. You wait till tomorrow. I think he'll probably go to the store for me. Okay. Well, just give me one moment. I just moment. hope nobody hurts him now. Okay. <laughs> give me one moment. We'll put it, and also what we do, we'll put an extra watch on your residence. Are you going to stay at home or are you going to go stay with Louise? I, I, I guess I'll, I'll stay at my house. Okay. Well, give me a few minutes and we'll, we'll see can we get you home, okay? All right.
Okay, that another one die on me. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a while well, we're, we're getting equipment re rearranged here. We'll take a short break. So I'll rise and I'll let you go back to your jury while we're all right. set for our next witness. After transporting um, the two defendants to the court this morning, came up to the front of the courtroom and I met the jurors and escorted them around to the back to the jury room through the secure doors. While walking through the back hallway, um, one of the jurors mentioned to me that she met us. She saw she met us our vehicle convoy on Atlanta Road. Um, she said while we were driving on Atlanta Road, she was next to our vehicles and she looked inside the rear passenger compartment and was able to pick out Miss Elkins mainly by her hair. She picked out her hair. She said, I know that hair, I know that person. That's exactly what she said to me. Um, I, kinda, I just kind of laughed it off and dismissed it because I didn't know what to say to her at the time um, and uh, just let it go and then talked to my supervisor who brought it to the court's attention. When she said it, there were no other jurors to me in our vicinity we were standing in the coffee room because as we were walking back, she was talking about how she met us on Atlanta Road, and I was kind of confused about what she said. And um, I was kind of questioning her on it a little bit more. And we were standing in the coffee room section over there, and that's when I put it all together that she said she was coming down Atlanta Road. She said she saw this and what exactly what she saw. I do not believe any other jurors, there were no other jurors in there, and I do not believe any other jurors heard her comments. Yes. It was the, uh, the female in the satin green blouse. It, I believe it's alternate number three. Your Honor, I'm asking 
suggest would be to go grab that juror and separate her. I suggest would be to go grab that juror and separate her from the rest while we have this, this, the rest of this discussion. Now, either side have any questions for the deputy? I can place them under oath. So does anybody have any, anything they wish to ask the deputy? No, no, no. I think I have questions for the Five questions. No questions for, 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 for the deputy. Uh, I don't think there's any question. He's reported uh, what's happened uh, to the best of his ability. We appreciate the candor. the extent of uh, potential contamination. I'll, I'll be happy to ask the questions. What questions would you like me to ask? It's, really, it's, 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 it's Mrs. Elkins who she saw, not, not, you know, apparently so. Well, no, I think the question would be, you know, did you... Since I'm, releasing her, since I'm releasing her prejudice that she may have is irrelevant. Well, but, sir, what did, what did she tell the other jurors? What if she may be commenting the other jurors or maybe then we can decide what, where to go from there. Bring her in, please. Are you interested? Are you interested? Does either side wish? Do we need to place, give her, put her under oath? I guess, or she's already under oath in the trial, but I'm not sure if that's the same as the. The, the safer practice would probably be to put her under oath.
Can you find any questions? Matt Lane, Mr. Gall. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't look like we're going to finish today. Okay. So I'm going to release you. Okay. Okay. All right, you are excused. You get to go home right now. Judge, I've got a big family. I'm sure I could find a wedding tomorrow myself. <laughs> All right, well, now I've got the jurors out. Um, Your Honor, I have not communicated with her. I, I, did not recall the court directing me to do so I last night. Yeah. But to be candid with the court, we don't have an opposition to Skype, and the way the case is going, I, I don't know that we'd get to that to, to, to that witness today anyway. Uh, or <coughs> do what we have to do, but um, I just want you to, I want to find out if that's even an issue, okay? Um, well, we can call it the lunch break and, and, and see if we can do it that way. Office call for her to see if that's a if that's a possibility. But we have we can do a, we have Skype on. I know we have Skype on on my uh, staff attorney's so computer right here. We can hook it in there. It can come right through the big big screen in there. But um, if she has has a laptop and has a camera on it, then we'll be good to go. We could probably even have a pork and pork over there and. The court is declined to allow Ms. Copeland ask the question, since her client's a juvenile. And you have, I read the cases. Unfortunately, those of you, of course, another case really deal with, other than the one North Carolina case dealing with the, that plea, you know, there's nothing really on point here. Um, the court feels like since the, the juvenile, I'll let you ask Ms. Copeland, as does her client have a deal? What I'm not going to do because is allow you to ask her what her fee was. I think it's irrelevant. I can't. I cannot think of any logical relevant connection. This jury would not know whether a five thousand dollar fee was a good fee, or twenty thousand, or or fifty thousand. Uh, I'm not going to let you go into what motion she's filed or hasn't filed. This jury is not confident unless there's a lawyer on there of uh, what the on trial strategy that representing a 15-year-old or 14-year-old in, in a murder case. Um, it, it serves, it's almost like asking, it's asking like a legal, uh, a witness's legal conclusions. It would mean nothing to the jury. It would just be a, a waste of time uh, for them to, to hear uh, and then plus, I mean, what she does and what she doesn't do has got to be based upon communications with her client. So you're, you know, uh, you're trying to get in from the, um, the uh, back door, which you can't get in. Now, she may, um, but I'm going to let you ask her from the jury, does she have a deal with her? Did she uh, negotiate a deal with, uh, with her client? Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. May I make a request to the court? Yes. I have done some research, Ron, and I've also spoken to President Carlson this morning. I would urge the court to reconsider its decision to allow this question to occur in the presence of the jury. Oh, well, I don't I think I, I would do what I, my plan on doing first would be allow, we have to do this outside the presence of the jury. Yes. So that I could determine what questions are appropriate and not appropriate. Um, and then the, court what the case law in, in, in the defense's favor, you know, allows for, because of the wink, wink, nod, nod issue, they allow great latitude in exploring if whether or not a defendant even has the lowest hope of maybe getting a deal. With the witness. With the witness. With the witness. Not the lawyer. 
That's right. And I, I read those at midnight last night in the cases that were cited. And it's with the witness, with the witness. And I would ask the court, if you're going to do it outside the presence of the jury, and then reserve ruling on whether you will permit any questions to be asked of Ms. Copeland in the presence of the jury. And with that, I would urge the court to let's call the next witness. Uh, Ms. Copeland. Well, Your Honor, we'll digest the, the court's ruling th this morning. Uh, if the court's going to put us in a position where we can ask and she can say no and then we're not allowed to follow up any questions, we're, we're right back in the same issue we had the other day with what's collateral and what's not. You may have a question that I would allow, but I'm just telling you that it's going to be severe. I'm not going into, I'm not going to go into matters which, one, I feel are irrelevant, and, out, and then secondly, outside the presence of the jury, and thirdly, would just confuse the, the issue. Uh, I'm not going to get this trial, I'm not going to digress into then the state calling defense attorneys in rebuttal, saying, oh no, I would charge 50000 or no, I would only charge 5000 It would never end. And then I'm not going to allow them, then they're going to have to get into whether or not, if, whether she filed a general motion or specific motions or no motions, uh, whether she plans on maybe you know, what her trial strategy is, it's so invasive into the uh, carny client, um, I'm not going to go there. I could find no case in the United States that allowed those type of questions to go forward. And maybe you will change the law for all of America if this, if this case were to go up on appeal, Mr. Gall, you know, if, if, if that comes to that. But, you know, at this point, I've, I've read the, as many cases as I could, and, uh, and I, I'm going to let you ask the question, but, you know, you know, has she, since her, if the client were an adult, I probably wouldn't even let you ask that one question. Uh, but since it's a juvenile, if you want to ask her under oath, then does, it, does her client have a deal? Then you, you know, I'm going to let you ask that question and, put it, and probably put that in front of the jury. But we'll do it outside the presence of the jury first. Your Honor, I concur with Mr. Lo, uh, Mr. Economo. Uh-oh. I, I almost confused Mr. Lockwood for Mr. Econo for a moment, and I'll be hearing about that for no, days to come. No, it was the concurrence that shocked me. But uh, I would concur with Mr. Economo that it might be best to ask those questions and let the court make well, actually, we'll do it outside, make, the, outside the, the presence jury. of the jury. I, I get that. Y'all check on that. All right, we ready to bring our next witness in? Uh, we are, Your Honor. Okay, who are you calling next? Heather Clyder. But we, uh, no, I'm sorry, Your Honor, we, we still have the video and one or two still pictures to get. So if you'll give us two minutes to get that, and then we'll be ready to call Heather Clyde. You can put her on the witness stand now, I guess. Is that a video to show her? Yes. And we're also getting there two photo uh, spreads. This one has already been tendered. Yes, Back in order, and we're very appreciative of that. K-L-E-I-D-E-R. Yes. 
Right, At some point in time, I would like to, I need to enter onto the record the Here. colloquy between the court and your client on his right to testify. Okay. And also on your client, yes, Ms. Elkins, right. okay? Um, some courts like to do it at the beginning of defense case. To me, it makes more sense towards the end. Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I said some courts like to do it at the beginning, but I think it makes more sense to do it towards the end. Your Honor, the way this case is developing, the later you inquire, the better, I think. Uh, yeah, I found 60 10. Your Honor, we are ready. All right, let's all rise for the jury. Let's all rise for the jury. Call your next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Heather Clyder. Dan, raise your right hand and be sworn. Ma'am, would you please state your full name for the jury? A Heather Marion Clyder. And where do you live? What part of town do you live in? Atlanta. DeKalb County. Okay. All right. And uh, how long have you lived in uh, Atlanta? All right. Uh, I take it you were, you were born somewhere else? I was born in South Carolina but raised in Arizona. Um, did you attend college in Arizona? I did. I, um, I have an undergraduate degree from University of Arizona. And then um, my doctorate and master's degree is from Arizona State. Now, your, your undergraduate degree, uh, what kind of degree was that? I have two. I have a business degree, and then I have a psychology degree as well in undergrad. All right. And, and then you, you went on to uh, the next level? Right. So then I went to Arizona State to get my master's and my Ph.D. in uh, cognitive psychology. And what, what, again, was the field for your Ph.D.? was cognitive psychology. All right. Should I be calling you doctor? Yes. All right. Dr. Clyder, um, uh, following your graduation, um, did you obtain any other professional credentials in, in the field of uh, cognitive science? Well, in cognitive science, um, most often, and I did as well, a uh, postdoc, which is you get more training after your degree. Um, I did that at Claremont Graduate University, where I was mentored by someone who did, um, had been doing cognitive research in eyewitness memory, actually, for about 20 years. So I did that prior to my professorship at Georgia State. 
All right. Um, in terms of your uh, academic work, where, where was your first position? Right after my um, postdoc is uh, Georgia State University. That's where I am right now. And I'm a tenured professor at Georgia State. Okay. Right, we're, I'm trying to go through this chronologically, okay? Um, your first teaching position was at Arizona State? Oh, I, um, yeah, I was a, a, I taught at Arizona State prior to my completing my degree. Uh, All right. Oh, okay. Uh, and then after your degree, uh, what year did you start with Georgia State University? 2004. And what was your position then? An assistant professor. And then in 2010, did your position change? Yes, I was promoted and tenured, and so now I'm an associate professor. And uh, you belong to several professional associations, do you not? That's correct. I, um, I'm a full member of the Psychonomic Society, which is um, a professional organization of cognitive psychologists. Um, I'm an associate um, member of the um, Neuroscience Institute at Georgia State University. I train um, brains and behavior fellows. I um, train other PhD students in, in memory and decision-making research. I'm the chair of cognitive sciences at Georgia State as well. Um, and I serve on, the, uh, on several different boards at the university as well. All right. Um, in connection with your professional work, do you do volunteer work <coughs> with regard I, to expert witness identification? I do. Um, I give talks at law schools. I give talks in communities. Um, and I give talks in other classrooms other than my own about memory, decision-making, eyewitness memory, and, and things that affect um, the community generally. Are you a volunteer advisor for any uh, groups in Georgia? I do consult with the um, Innocence Project when I'm called to do so. All right, and that's the Georgia Innocence Project or is that the national? The Georgia Innocence Project. All right. And you assist them in cases in which there are questions about eyewitness testimony? That's correct. Now, uh, I believe you've already indicated you're, you're training future uh, doctoral candidates at I, Georgia I State I do currently now, now and I have, a, I have a lab where I um, <coughs> conduct research. I, I train and mentor PhD students as well as undergraduate students. I currently have three graduate students under, under me right now, and I have um, six or eight undergrads in addition to my regular teaching schedule. Um, my primary um, work entails, other than teaching courses, is I do research, I publish studies, I write grants, and, and I work on advisory boards as well. And have you published any uh, articles in your field? I do. Um, I've published 12 articles thus far. I, on average, is two a year publish, and I present at professional conferences uh, regularly as do my graduate students. And one of those uh, publications is the Journal of General Psychology? General Psychology, um, Memory and Cognition, um, Journal of Experimental Psychology, Psychological Science. All these research journals are um, peer-reviewed journals, which means any research that is published in a peer-reviewed journal means that it has to go through a rigorous peer-reviewed process determining that the science is valid. And in a, well, Your Honor, based on that stipulation, we've moved this time to Tan Harris, an expert in, in the field of cognitive science, and specifically uh, with respect to eyewitness identification. Fine, she's an expert. Allow her to give opinion testimony thereof. Ma'am, is it fair to say that there's been some considerable research into the issue of eyewitness identification? Has been in the last, probably from the mid-70s, um, a lot of research has been done trying to look at the, the context, the factors, and things that influence um, memory generally, but eyewitness memory specifically. And specifically, uh, has that research focused on memory function? Um, Oftentimes, when, whether it be students or whether it be community members, I, I ask people what they think about how memory functions. And 
other than people always saying, oh, my memory is terrible, can you help me? Which is like the first thing people say when I tell them I study memory, is people often think that memory works like a videotape. And if there's something that they want to look at, they can roll back in this videotape and find that specific episode. And everybody has some sort of experience where I'm sure they felt like they have something that they were absolutely really sure about. But what we've learned over this 20 plus years of research is that memory is very malleable. And it's updated at the time that you record the information with things that you hear from other people that you're thinking about, things that you expect from similar situations. And it's also updated at the time that you retrieve the information. So when you try and go back and find that episode in mind, it's also updated and malleable as well. And there's been a, a plethora of research looking at what are the factors that influence these things every day and what are the things that influence things specifically in an eyewitness situation where some of the context would change. And so there are a variety of factors that, that influence this. All right. Um, is memory static? As in not moldable? No, it's not static. That, is that for the reasons you, you previously explained, or are there other factors there? There, there are a variety of factors that influence this. Um, with regard to um, eyewitness memory, some of the things that have been shown to regularly influence um, accuracy of recall are cross-race effects, which I can talk about more if you'd like me to. Um, some things such as the amount of physiological stress and arousal that one feels during um, witnessing an event. And also things like um, susceptibility to suggestion. And as I said, memory is very malleable. So you can incorporate the things that you hear other people say or that you're thinking about or sometimes you can be confused by where you get information. All these things come together to influence your record of memory. So when you go to try to retrieve that memory, now it's not this pure memory like people think they have. It's been updated and influenced by all this other information. And we, we look at these, um, these, this information both behaviorally through experimental studies to try and find out what are the things that influence this. But even more recently, we've been able to support some of the data that we found through neuroscience. And we can look at brain scans. And when people are thinking a certain way or responding a certain way, we can look for activation that also supports this as well. So if you'd like me to talk about any of these particular things, I can. But those are some of the things that, that there are a wide variety of things that influence memory <coughs> accuracy. Um, these are a few things that influence it in eyewitness memory specifically. Um, you, you, are, you mentioned stress and arousal as being factors that affect uh, memory uh, in the context of identification. Um, what is the effect of acute stress on perception and identification, if you know to a reasonable degree of professional certainty? Well, this, is, this has been one area, as you can imagine, that people have been very interested in trying to um, understand sort of the mechanisms that would help someone to retrieve information accurately or not. Because people have this sense that um, if it's something really scary or something's really intense, I'm going to remember every detail about it. And what we find through the research, um, whether it be just a few studies or a large meta-analysis, which was done in 2004, let me just say, a meta-analysis is when you take all this research that people have done looking at this topic and you blend it all together and you look at all the data and say, what is the general finding? Because science builds upon itself. So you're going to find some people that are going to find different things than other people, but we have a meta-analysis that everyone all together. And what is the general finding? And the general finding is physiological stress and arousal, increased heart rate, sweat rate, all these things that we can actually measure in a lab, or if I asked you if you're stressed and aroused, you could tell me on a scale of 1 to 10 how stressed and aroused you were. When people are stressed and aroused, their memory is worse, not only for perpetrators of crimes, but for the details of the crime. And this is consistent, and it's even most, most the case when you're looking at lab versus field studies, eyewitness studies, it's even worse with eyewitness studies than in a laboratory-based study where you can artificially stress someone, but it's not the same <coughs> situation as you find in the field. So this is a consistent finding. So stress and arousal is detrimental to memory and accurate retrieval. And people think, well, how can this be the case? Well, if, it's, if you're stressed and aroused about something, it's not like you forget it happened. You remember it happened. It's just the details surrounding it are what you don't remember because you're focused on other things. Your attention's dispersed. And so as that happens, people are less likely to remember the details. And like I said, this is a consistent finding as well. Is there something known in the literature as a weapon effect? 
weapon focus effect, as I mentioned, when you, when you think about attention being dispersed, people remember what it is that they attend to. And if I am, and the weapon focus effect is an example of shifts of attention. So weapon focus effect is a finding where if there is a weapon, specifically a gun, present in a scene, people have a tendency to focus on the weapon. And when you're focusing on the weapon, you're not focusing on the, the face of the assailant. And so people remember more about the weapon than they do about the face of the assailant. And this has been found in behavioral studies, as I mentioned, where you find these accuracy differences with somebody has a weapon versus when they don't. But the question was, well, is this really an attention thing? Is this where people are looking or not looking? So they've done these eye tracker studies where you can look at a scene and then they check where the focus of your eyes are. And what they find is that when people are looking at a scene with a weapon, the eye tracker shows that people's attention focus, where their eyeballs are, they'll look all around, look at the face, look at the gun, look at the gun, look at the gun. They don't look at the face. And this has been a regular finding as well, which supports this idea that attention shifting to the gun. And this is why in these studies, when people are looking at accuracy, it tends that people don't remember the face as well when a weapon's present. Okay, so that's weapon focus. It's also an attention shift. Over time, how does the memory functioning affect recall uh, of identification related events? So from the time of recording the information to the time that you are trying to remember the information, um, is there's a, there's a time course to memory fade. Um, it's actually called Ebbinghaus Forgetting Curve. And generally what we find is over Ebbinghaus Forgetting Curve. Um, and, and generally what we find over time is that the longer the time from the recording of the information, this is whether it be a word list, this is the same whether it be an event, whether it's scary or not, you initially remember the information the best you're going to remember it immediately at that time. And over time, you start to lose the details of the information where you're left with kind of a general idea of what it was that you remembered or what it was that you saw or heard or read initially. And, and this is, you know, and this isn't anything that seems um, unusual for anybody. I, I, probably everybody has an experience where over time you start to forget things. But, but this is the same whether it be something that's very arousing or not. You end up losing information over time. All right. Uh, and you, that, that's what the studies show. But in terms of uh, what's called certainty or confidence, uh, how do studies of that compare with the, the actual studies of recall over time? So studies specifically looking at memory confidence generally find that people can be, the general finding is that people can be really, really confident in something, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be very, very accurate. And this has been shown throughout, um, like I said, studies for words, eyewitness memory studies in particular, and um, some of the most compelling studies were done um, looking at the events of 9-11, where like, seven weeks after 9-11, people would um, fill out this survey of, here are all these things that happened, and here's how confident I am. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure this is what happened. This is how I found out about this. This is what I was wearing. This is what I was told. This is what I saw. And then a year later, people are tested on this, and their confidence is equally as high but they're wrong. So it's, I can be very, very confident in something and be very inaccurate. And we find this to be the case in any sort of memory situation. You know, this is how memory works. And I'm sure you've all had some situation where you've had some sort of argument with a, a spouse or a sibling or something over what you did for your birthday two years ago. And they said, we went to an Italian restaurant. You're like, no, I didn't go to an Italian restaurant. I know that we went to this um, Asian place. It's my favorite place. You argue back and forth and you're so sure and then you call a friend and they say, well, no, it really was the Italian place because I was there with you and I brought this, you know, big balloon or whatever. And you're like, I was so sure. And this is, and so if, if you are thinking about that, you felt absolutely sure about this situation, but you were wrong, but your confidence remained high. And we find this to be the case in other studies of memory as well. In eyewitness cases, there have been done, uh, eyewitness studies, there have been done all of these different, um, looking at memory for the crime scene, memory for people in the crime scene, and the general finding is, except for the people that are at the 90 to 95% confidence, those people are the most accurate, and their accuracy is only like in like the 70 to 80% zone. 
for the most confident people. So, you know, that cor correlation is even lower when you're going to the, the less confident folks. So, so what I'm here to say is that the confidence accuracy correlation is not a reliable correlation. But turning a little bit more specifically to the case before us, are there factors involved in the eyewitness identification process that can impact the reliability and the, and the certainty of the identifications? For example, is there something known as verbal overshadowing? What, would, what is verbal overshadowing? Verbal overshadowing is, if you, if you think about that memory, you can't go in and like dig out somebody's memory for something. It's like what we call a memory trace where you have this fleeting group of neurons together that, that are activated to produce this sort of episode in your life. So you've got this fleeting picture in your head of someone that you saw at a crime scene at the grocery store or whatever. You've got this picture. And if I were to ask you to describe that person, it's hard to describe facial things that you don't normally use words for. If I ask you to try and describe your mom, people would come out and they'd say, well, she has curly hair, and you start describing these things, and it doesn't, then it could be anybody. Well, the problem with verbal overshadowing is you have this picture in your head, this loose picture of what someone looks like. You start to use verbal terms to describe something that you don't normally think of verbally, and then that description ends up becoming your memory through the person's face. So what we find over time is that the more that's those you the more people that describe the more the picture of this face looks less like the person that they're actually trying to describe. Okay, this is part of that malleability that malleability of memory as well. Okay. You can you can it's almost like self-suggestion. But you can get suggestion from other people too. When other people give you information about who they saw, what they saw, what you should have seen, all these things are incorporated. So it makes you either second guess yourself, change what it is that you, you're thinking about, and then that becomes your memory. It's not like the other memory is hidden somewhere. It's, you, you can't access the other memory. This is the memory now. Do you have a reasonable opinion to a uh, degree of professional certainty, a reasonable degree of professional certainty as to the, the impact of repeatedly talking about identification on, on its accuracy and recall? Well, the studies show that the more that you're talking about something and the more that you describe, the more your memory becomes consistent with your description over time. And so after a while, as I was mentioning, that description over time becomes your new memory. Are you familiar with a, a, a phrase known as validation? I know what validation is. It means different things in different contexts. But in the context of eyewitness identification, is there an issue with respect to recall, memory and recall, uh, after the identification, in terms of the response of people to that identification? When someone makes a decision, either you're given a lineup and, and you make a decision about the lineup, people have a hard time divorcing themselves from that selection. So once people have made a selection, that selection now is their memory for the perpetrator. Even if they're shown other lineups, subsequent lineups, that's now their memory because now that's what they've selected and people are looking for outside cues also to support them in that. And that can come from a variety of ways. That can come from other people. That can come from um, just self-talk. That can come from thinking it over and thinking it over and thinking it over. All these things end up encouraging someone to try and, and support their selection. In, in your research, is it common for people to reach out for validation post-identification? I wouldn't say that, that they reach out, but I would say that when it's presented to them in such a way that is supportive, people take note of that. So if someone makes a selection and then people are said either by you know, a police officer, another witness, or someone else saying, oh, good job, or that's the right one, then people are, feel supported by this. And it's like, okay, because witnesses generally want to do a good job. You know, they're trying to do the right thing. They want, to, they want to find the perpetrator. And so if they get some cue from someone else that the right person is there, they want to do the right thing. They want to select them. They're trying to do a good job. And so they use these cues to help support 
their choice that, okay, I, I did the right thing, I'm a good citizen, I, I did the good thing. But over time, can they distinguish between those cues and their actual recall? No, because this all is part of this sort of malleability of memory. Now all these things become together, now this is their memory. And they actually, studies, even recent studies, as in last year, showed that when people are encouraged in any way that um, before someone makes a selection of, oh, you, you really saw the person, or, oh, I know you can do this, something like that, that suggests to the, to the person who's going to make the selection that the person's there. So it's really hard for them not to make a suggestion and what they, a selection. And when they find when people do do that, um, they're more confident than when they're not given this sort of encouragement. So they're confident when they make a selection, whether they're right or they're wrong. Let me ask you about a specific issue in, in the field of, of cognitive science and eyewitness identification. And that's known as cross-racial identification. Um, can you tell the jury what cross-racial identification, why that's an issue in eyewitness identification? Okay, so um, cross-race cross, cross race identification, um, there are a couple of different names for it. It's also called um, own race bias. And in the literature, it's um, also called um, they all look alike effect. And that's actually what they call it. And this is the same whether it be um, African-American identifying Asian, Asian, Hispanic, Hispanic, African-American, white. It, it works across the board. It also works with people trying to identify people much older than themselves, okay? So it's actually um, more of an in-group, out-group bias. But the finding is generally is, and I'll explain to you what the theory is about why this happens, but people are, are much better reliably at being able to identify someone within their in-group than someone from their out-group. And it's, it's again this attention idea. So people when they initially see someone, if it's someone within their in-group, they, they are quick to take the details of that person and record that information in mind. Whereas it's someone that's in the out group, they do a cursory overview and then categorize them in order, sort of a lump category. So when they go back to try to retrieve the information, you have fewer details, you're less likely to differentiate. So now you have all these people in this lineup from another race, you've done kind of a cursory overview to begin with, now you're trying to retrieve that, and all this information there, it, they all look alike because you didn't do any real detailed recording. And this is, this is like a, a very, bless you, a very regular finding. There's been large meta-analyses that are done, which again, like I was saying, these big overviews, we take all these studies and we lump them all together and say, what's the general finding? This is a very consistent finding. It's a very reliable finding. And there have also been some, some um, questions about, well, maybe this would go away or be reduced as cross-race bias or cross-race effect if someone has a lot of exposure to someone from another race. But that isn't the case that only has a very, very nominal difference. So you can have a lot of exposure to people of other races and it doesn't reduce the likelihood of this, this cross-race bias. And I'm, I do cross-race studies at Georgia State. We're a very diverse population and I find these effects regularly. So this is, is more evidence of that you find this. You, you find that people do not record the details of other race people to the same extent they do own race people. Now, the only time this um, improves is if someone is in an, an intimate relationship with someone from another race where they have to then record the details of the other people in order to be able to differentiate. You find differences there. Um, you can find this effect attenuates if someone gets a really long look at someone. Okay, but that's generally not the finding. It's generally this cost is affected. It, it's across, as I mentioned, other races um, and different groups of people, older folks and really young folks, you find this to be the case as well. And to be clear, in the research, does it matter which two different races you study? Is it a black-white thing or an Asian-Hispanic thing? Does it matter which, the, which two races are involved in the cross-race identification? Where you see less of this is um, African-American people identifying white people you see less of this, and there's a bunch of cultural reasons, theories behind why that is, but that's really the only time you find less of this. Um, you generally find this with white people in any minority, and minority um, folk like Hispanic and black, you find the same effect. Asian, you find the same effect. 
It only seems to be a sort of cultural thing where you find less of it, an attenuated effect, when it's um, <coughs> African Americans identifying white people. <coughs> All right. Let me ask you about something known as a photo spread or six pack. Uh, are you familiar with those phrases? I am, yes. All right. Uh, can you explain to the jury the science behind a photo spread? Well, I, I can explain how theoretically you're supposed to construct a photo spread or a photo array. Um, so a photo array is designed such that no one in the photo array should stand out any more than anyone else. And there's been there's a huge amount of research looking at how to create a fair lineup. And the general finding is you should create the lineup such that it's matched to description, which means that if I'm going to describe a person in a certain way, then all of the people in the lineup should match that description. There shouldn't be any, any one person that stands out any more than anyone else. And if someone does stand out more than someone else, it's considered an unfair or a bias, bias lineup, meaning if I describe somebody as having red curly hair and really, really white skin, and there's only one red curly haired person in there, or there's, everybody has red curly hair, but everybody's really tan and one guy has white skin, <clears throat> well, that was the only one who matched my description. So now I'm feeling compelled that that must be the one. It's really hard to avoid that because what, what we have is it's called a relative comparison strategy. So you're going to pick the person that looks most like the person that you remember. Even if the person's not there, you feel compelled to pick someone. And we find this even more to be the case um, in a cross-race identification, but we also find this to be the case in, in, in laboratory studies, you know whether the right person's there or not. Because in a laboratory, we've created the crime scene, we know who the perpetrator is, so we know if you're right or wrong. Okay. So in those situations, we have what's called a target absent photo array, which means you know the wrong person, that the right person is not there, or a target present, which is we do know the right person is there because we're the ones that set the crime scene up so we know who it is. Okay. And you really find these sorts of, of errors um, in a target absent lineup because people want to pick someone. They want to pick someone, someone that matches the description. Okay. And if you're encouraged that, oh, you can do the right thing, I know you can do the right thing, then people have a tendency to pick someone from any lineup, especially if someone stands out. The way to make a lineup fair or to make a photo spread fair is no one should stand out. I should be able to show any of you a lineup and not know anything about the description, and you shouldn't, they all look, they all look alike. I don't know. There's no one that stands out to me. And all so right. that's the science behind that. Now, when you're doing the, the, the photo array, I think that's actually the phrase that you use. Um, typically, we use six photos. Is that, in your experience, the custom in law enforcement? In law enforcement, six, yes. You might use more, I take it. Sometimes nine or more in, uh, in experimental studies, but six is, is the norm. All right. Uh, now, if you're going to include the target, then you need five other individuals, right? Photos. Right. Okay. Right. And we call those fillers? Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and the problem you've described is when the fillers are dis, uh, are, they need to be dissimilar fillers from the target. Well, the problem is, is if the target looks different from the foils, then the target's going to stand out. So you don't want dissimilar fillers. You, they all actually need to look alike. They do. They all need to match the description. That's correct. Because if there's a, a characteristic, one or two characteristics that have been identified by, by the uh, person that you want to present the, the photo array to, all of the people in there need to have those same characteristics. That's correct. And that would be, and what happens, again, if you don't make sure that they all have those same, same characteristics that have been specifically identified? What happens when you show that to the person and they only see those specific identifying traits on one person in the photo? photo that array? would be considered a biased lineup and people are more likely to what we call false alarm to that person, whoever it is who's false alarm. If, um, if it's something that you created in the lab, it would be considered a false alarm, meaning you're going to make a misidentification of this person who looks like the person. Um, if the target is actually there, then it's going to be biased because you're going to be drawn to pick that person because that's the only one that matches the description. All right. And in the practice of, of presenting photo arrays, 
is the presentation of the array important in the, for the reliability of the process? Yes, it is. Can you explain why? Why the presentation is important? Because what you are, the whole goal is that you're wanting the person who is the witness to use whatever they have that I told you that fleeting picture they have in their mind and you don't want to influence that picture in any way. So what you want is them to take that picture that they have in their mind and use that to see if the, that particular person is actually there in the photo array. And if you do something to make that process more difficult then people are compelled to make other decisions. Do you, have a reasonable, do you have a professional opinion to a reasonable degree of professional certainty uh, as to whether the presentation of a photo array should be accompanied by any particular words as to the likelihood or non likelihood of the subject being in the photo array? Yes. Um, this is another meta analysis review that is looking at trying to keep one's memory as pure as possible and not suggest it to anyone because again as I mentioned people are looking for supporting cues that they're doing the right thing so giving what's called an unbiased um, lineup would be to tell someone that the person um, that is the perpetrator may or may not be present in the lineup and in doing that that gives people the opportunity to say okay maybe the person isn't in there so I'm still a good citizen, a good witness, even if they're not there. That would be the cue to them, that I, I, I can make the decision whether or not they're there. I'm still within my rights. Um, what has been recently found, and I mentioned earlier, is that this unbiased instruction, if you will, um, ends up being thwarted if prior to that someone says, oh, you can pick them, do, you can do a good job, I know you saw them. Okay, now the person may or may not be there. Now when you do that, now this may or may not be there doesn't have any effect and people are likely to pick someone regardless. When you don't have that and you give someone this, they may or may not be there, then people have a tendency to make more accurate decisions. That means that if the person isn't there, they feel comfortable saying, I don't see the person. Now you've been retained uh, by the defense in this case. Yes. Yes. You're being paid to be here. I am. Were you sent materials? Uh, to review in preparation for your testifying here today. Yes, I was. Uh, do you recall whether you were sent a uh, photo array uh, which was indicated to you to have been used in the uh, Sherry West investigation? I mean, uh, yeah, Sherry West. Uh, Sherry West identification in the uh, death of Antonio Santiago. I was sent a photo array, yes. You sent... Um, uh, any videos? I was sent three videos. And those were uh, of interviews and identification of made by Ms. West? One was an identification of the lineup um, where Ms. West was there. Um, one was a reenactment staged by, I believe it was the police department. She was there reenacting. And then another one was um, of an interview which looked to be like at a, at a police precinct. Those were the three different tapes that I saw. All right. And um, Your Honor, let the record reflect that showing what's been marked State's Exhibit 45 to the state. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Okay. Ma'am, I'll show you what's been marked for identity. Actually, admitted it is State's Exhibit 45 in this case. It purports to be a photo array. Uh, have you seen that or seen a copy of that before? I have seen a copy of this. Do you have any opinion to a reasonable degree of professional certainty as to whether that photo array is facially suggestive? Facially suggestive? Is that what yes. you said? Yes, on its face, just, just looking at the photo array. Well, I would say that the fact that one person's shirt is a different color um, makes him stand out, regardless of anything else about him. And then the facial hair is not the same across all of the, all of the pictures here. 
All right. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, do any of those individuals appear to have asymmetrical hair? Yes. One has asymmetrical hair. One has a different um, kind of like pursing his lips. He has sort of an odd facial expression. They all look a little bit different other than that they're all African-American. And one of them have earrings in, in that photo array? Yes. Right. And I don't, two of them do and the other ones do not. Now, just looking at it on its face, it, 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 in your professional opinion, it, it, it is suggestive. I would say it's suggestive. Now, you've also reviewed some of the case information, at least police summaries of the investigation in this case. That's true, yes. You are aware of some of the facial features that were identified by Ms. West? Yes. All right. Does everyone in that photo array have curly hair as described by Ms. West? No, not everyone has the same length of curly hair, which was part of the description that she gave. Does everyone have full lips as described by Ms. West? Can't hear you. Your Honor, the, the exhibit is in the evidence. It'll, it'll speak for itself. I mean, at this point, I think we're just rehashing what's already in evidence. The, the photo itself, the it, line of it speaks for itself, Your Honor. Your Honor, I think it's a little late in the day, having stipulated to her expertise and allowed her to lay the foundation for the testimony, not to be able to ask her questions about the suggestiveness of the actual photo spread in this case. Well, ask you have her, uh, she's your witness, and you're not supposed to be leading her, so I mean, if you just ask her what she finds is, let her say, and then All right. not just to keep asking about every single body part. I mean, ask her to tell you. Okay. Now, having reviewed the, the specific uh, identification uh, features referenced by Ms. West, um, is this photo array, in your professional opinion, to a reasonable degree of certainty, suggestive in the context, not just facially, but in terms of the actual information provided by Ms. West? I would say it's suggestive, yes, and that not everybody is meeting that description. Your Honor, let the record reflect I'm showing what's been marked States Exhibit 158 to the state. Ma'am, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification purposes as Exhibit 158. <coughs> and that purports to be a photo array presented for identification to Wilfredo Calix Flores. Were you asked to review the uh, uh, identification evidence with respect to the Flores investigation? I was not. May I ask you this, are you bilingual? I am not. Are you able to interpret Spanish language uh, uh, communications for yourself? Not more than a few words. All right. Um, I'm just going to ask you whether, do you, whether you have a, and I want you to take a moment to examine it before I ask you, the, uh, ask you any more questions about it. Do you have a, uh, an opinion to a reasonable degree, a professional opinion, to a reasonable degree of professional certainty as to whether the photo spread identified and admitted as State's Exhibit 158 is facially suggestive? I would say it's suggestive in the same way that the previous lineup was suggestive. Well, the... the, the, the yes. The, the, okay. Um, in the same ways. In the same way. To be fair, have the, uh, the, the photographs have been moved around, have they not? They have been. Uh, but nevertheless, the moving, moving the photos around hasn't changed the suggestive aspects of that photo array, has it? It has not. The description is <coughs> that the witness gave is still not consistent across all of the, the foils presented. Uh, you're referring to the description by Ms. West. I am. Of course, you don't know what the description of Mr. Calix Flores was. No, I'm talking about the one that I saw, which was Ms. West. All right. Um, specifically, um, well, let me ask you this, then, could you, since you haven't reviewed the, all of the Flores information. Do you have a professional opinion to a reasonable degree of professional certainty as to the inclusion 
whether the inclusion of one photo in a photo array out of six photos with a green or light colored shirt would be suggestive if a witness had identified the attacker as wearing a green shirt. It would be suggestive. Thank you. Let the record reflect. I'm showing States Exhibit 157 to the state. May I approach, Your Honor? May. Ma'am, I'm showing you what's been admitted at States Exhibit 157. It reports to be a photo array and identification of a clever or clever R. Jimenez. If you take a moment to examine that. You don't know Clever Jimenez, do you? I do not. Never met him? No. Ever seen him? No. Ever read the file on, on uh, the case that he was involved in? Nothing right. from that okay. case, no. Do you have a professional opinion to a reasonable degree of professional certainty as to whether the photo array presented at States 157 is unduly suggestive on its face? It is suggestive. Ma'am, I believe you've already testified that you were asked to review a video tape uh, of, a, of at least part of an identification process for Sherry West. That's correct. I'm going to, I'm going to show you that video again. I'm going to ask you some specific questions about it. Ms. Blackman. Your Honor, the jury's already viewed the video and she's already viewed the video. Why are we going over this again? Your Honor, I'm sorry. When the state witnesses are testifying, they're constantly referencing the, the, the visual evidence that they believe is important to the case. As part of my examination of this witness, I believe the jury should actually get to hear the testimony of the witness about it while it's fresh in their mind, not two or three days later. You want to ask her a question about the uh, photo array lineup that made by Ms. West, the videotape of that? The, the short videotape. That's short right. videotape. And that is there a we're not, I don't, we're not just playing the video to be playing the video because all she can't, doesn't know, wasn't there. Are you asking her uh, a particular portion of it that she wants to comment on? What's your question? I'm not going to let you just play a video. We've already played over and over again. I mean, it's duplicit. We've already seen I'm that. I'm going to ask her whether any aspects of, of, of that presentation are suggestive. Okay. Has she seen the video? Yes. Okay. Ask her that question first. And then if we need to publish that to the jury, we will. Yes, Your Honor. Ma'am, having reviewed the, the video, when was the last time you were able to view the videotape uh, of the identification made by Ms. West? About a week and a half ago. Do you recall it well enough uh, this morning to be able to testify to it without having your memory refreshed? I do. Do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of professional certainty as to whether the identification uh, obtained by the police is reflected in States Exhibit 45, whether the videotaped uh, evidence of that uh, shows that that identification was suggestive. It was suggestive in my opinion. Can you explain to the jury the basis for your opinion? In the videotape when Ms. West was shown the lineup, they asked her um, whether or not she saw the perpetrator in the lineup and she was unsure and she said I, I don't know I think maybe it's this guy so the police you know she hands it to the police the police say so if you're sure about this then you want to mark number one or whatever the number is which says you're positive so she's like well hand it back to me again so they hand it back to her so she looks at it again and in the video, she discusses it with some woman who was standing there with her. I don't know who the woman was that she was discussing it, but she was discussing it with her. She's nodding again, and then she said, okay, I still think it's that guy, whatever number it was that she had identified. And they said, okay, so let's check off positive, correct? Right there, positive, you're sure. And she says, okay. There's no point at any time where she ever said she was sure. This is part of that external cue thing I was mentioning where she's wanting to pick the right person. She's getting these cues that she should, and she checks that off. However, she never at any point in time during what I saw said, this is the person I'm absolutely sure. 
there was no point where she was, was ever uncertain, wherever she was anything other than uncertain in her words. Thank you, ma'am. strange that there was someone talking to Miss West during the identification? I did find that strange. Is that a normal procedure? That is not normal. That wouldn't be a proper way to conduct the identification. That's and, true. Yeah. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to take about a, a ten minute break before. I have no questions for this one. You have no questions? Hang on. They're going to take a ten minute break. It's all right. <laughs>